Welcome, you're watching Kaleidoscope selling Kalife News Capsule. I've been to a few tourist places in Sri Lanka in the recent past and have been quite appalled on how we Sri Lankans treat our tourist sites. There's little regard for what this little paradise has given us and we have zero commitment to do anything to improve. We Sri Lankans are like frogs in a well, spewing forth meaningless rhetoric about tourist numbers, increasing but doing little to improve our product sustainably. There are 10,000 urgencies and with competition hotting up, however, if we don't do something soon, we can bid our cash cow goodbye. I invited Chalana Pereira, who's the founder of Retrace Hospitality, whose one mission has been to make Sri Lanka's tourism greener and cleaner, to talk about these 10,000 urgencies. What would you say are the 10,000 urgencies facing the tourism industry? We can summarize the many urgencies, I'm not sure if it's 10,000, but the multitude of urgencies in quite a simple form. I think with regards to Sri Lanka tourism, currently we need to focus on protecting the island and all of its resources, including human resources, ahead of promoting it or managing Sri Lanka ahead of marketing it. And I think that's really the key here. What does that entail for the public sector and the private sector, so the business community and the state, is it's really looking at understanding the value of the resources we have. Number one, that's the natural capital, the natural assets, getting a solid understanding of the valuation of those assets. Thereafter, you can determine how best to manage those destinations, looking at identifying carrying capacities at a micro destination level. We can look at a carrying capacity at a national level, and several studies have been done, but now it's focusing on the micro destination level. So there's an urgency on actually applying moratoria to stop building new accommodation in places like Kandy, in places like central Norelia, in places surrounding Yala National Park. Several other examples where you, first of all, prevent the development of accommodation that will then manage the flows of tourism footfall and actually help up uplift the quality of the existing stock. That's one of the multiple urgencies that when you start with that culture of discipline, then there's a appreciation of value and how to focus on value over volume or you know quality over quantity. That's really the, the, the crux of the urgency that we have. And then the human resources factor will be supported by that as well. Now, right now, anecdotal evidence suggests one in two of the employees in the sector in Sri Lanka, if had the opportunity or given the opportunity, will look to migrate, will look to leave, purely because of the cost of living. And if we have people who are leaving, but then we are trying to tell people to come visit, we've got the formula fundamentally wrong. So yes, from what you say, we truly have paradise here. Uh, but we also have competition, may not be with the same product, but there is competition and they're doing very well. What are we doing wrong? I think it's also about looking at it differently and not looking at, okay, who does Sri Lanka compete against, but rather the fact that we are an independent island, we are a sovereign nation, uh, as much as that might be hard to believe right now, uh, with all the support we're getting from the international community, um, th there's a very, very rich history where Sri Lanka was, has always been placed geographically in an interesting position for thousands of years, far before colonization as well, right? And we were always a hub for trade and transition and transaction. So. We have had a very strong identity, but post 1960s, 70s, when tourism started to develop post-independence and the economy opened up, we started to think of tourism as a marketable commodity and tried to then replicate that of either Thailand or Malaysia or Singapore or Dubai, or we've always had this positioning and identity crisis. And even our population struggles with that. So it's not about trying to emulate what is being done in other places, but it's trying to reinforce what is unique to us. Uh, and really, we have a culture of people who like to be proud about being Sri Lankan, but that's not being demonstrated in our product in tourism and how we manage the destination, right? So we're really obsessed with bringing brand X, brand Y, experience X, experience Y that you get in other countries and leaving behind the valuable, high quality, um, impact oriented local entrepreneurs that are actually trying to create a difference. And there are some excellent examples that have been operating in Sri Lanka for you know, 30, 40 years of locally homegrown products and experiences, accommodation, food concepts, wellness retreats, multiple that have existed way before the tourism development boom. I think we need to go back to our roots and to our core and from a business perspective that will become a very profitable model as well. If you were to draw up a plan for the industry, what would that plan entail, very briefly, in bullet point form? What we have is a complex operating environment where every stakeholder has a different vision and a different intention and idea. 
right? So if we talk to people in government and there within there's multiple schools of thought, they will have different visions, different political parties, different you know, bureaucrats versus politicians have different visions. So there is, that's been Sri Lanka's struggle, particularly post-independence. There is actually no central authority, right? While there are powerful individuals and powerful seats of governments from a regulatory perspective, when it comes to the positioning of the country and the island for us as locals, it is quite fragmented and evolved. Then the business sector, it's the same. The business community, it's the same. So when you look at developing a plan for an entire island, which has so many different stakeholders with different agendas, different pools of capital, and different history in terms of operating and, and experience, the plan needs to be zoomed down on a micro destination level. What are we doing with the city of Kandy? And then master planning those micro destinations that have been exploited and abused. That's the only way. If we're going to start at a national level, it's going to be too tricky. If you look at the DWC and the national park management, some parks are well managed, the majority are not. Any park that has had successful revenue generation to tourism is primarily exploitation. So again, then you have to address that baby in that context with the subject matter experts. I would put across the board scientists, ecologists, specialized experts and professionals to spearhead and lead and inform any planning for any destination, carrying capacity, even in urban environments, even the city of Colombo. You know, you take some mega projects that have come up around the Bear Lake, you literally can't walk there because it smells so bad. And these are some of those properties cost upwards of half a billion dollars individually to build, right? So that's the urban environment. Then you take the rural environment and there's very similar dynamics, right? So getting the scientists and getting that, you know, it's that manage before market perspective, informing it based on science as to how we develop the destination and operate the destination for locals and then for foreigners. Then another component that's key, which is quite linked, is data-driven decision-making. Less than 20% of the registered room inventory in this country contributes to professionally, uh, professional data aggregators internationally. And of that, a large majority, about 50% of that 20% of the registered rooms, which is just 20% of the total inventory, so tiny numbers, are actually chain scale affiliated properties, right? Brand X, brand Y, et cetera. So we are lacking data driven decision making across the board. And, and that opportunity is very low hanging because the younger generations are switched on, they get numbers, they get technology. So we need to inculcate that from a regulatory perspective. And actually right now Sri Lanka needs to make performance of hotels and restaurant businesses transparent. What is the ADR, average daily rates? What are the occupancies? We don't want to go into the PL to see operating costs, but what are the top line numbers? And make that transparent so that there's a common consensus because a lot of properties and businesses are actually struggling, but they might not show it. And the banks have a role to play. Who provides the funding and the lending? A lot of small scale entrepreneurs that are, you know, cash to cash managing their businesses, they're doing an excellent job. A lot of businesses that are not financially prudent, but have good relationships with banks, they get away with a lot. Right, so how that distorts the industry is also quite tricky from an accommodation and built environment perspective. And then one of the key elements that I've, I, I keep reiterating is looking at the people. Right? We think of product, but actually our product is rooted in our people. If we have an unhappy population who themselves can't afford to go on holidays, and we're trying to sell holidays to people from wealthier countries or nearby countries who might not be as wealthy, we have a fundamental issue there. So the planning needs to really prioritize the well-being of Sri Lankans and making sure that Sri Lankans, yes, if they want to migrate, let them. But it's not, the economic reasons are not the primary driver for migration, right? Maybe they want to live somewhere where there's snow or somewhere where it's, you know, quite advanced with technology. But if it's, oh, we can't afford to live here, but we want to live here, then we've really got from the public sector and private sector a fundamental issue to fix as step number one in that plan. Would you say Sri Lanka has a vision for the tourism industry or are we just happy just sitting and counting our numbers? There are certain stakeholders who are very happy to count numbers and those numbers typically are, you know, number of arrivals and in some cases billions of dollars of annual receipts and the calculations of both those are questionable. But it's fine, at least we have a a somewhat of a high level culture of statistics and, and discipline in keeping track of numbers. Those numbers I don't think are very accurate and very re representative, but there is at least this notion of, okay, let's look at numbers. But that's one specific stakeholder. Now, if you talk to people in the environmental community, if you talk to people who are managing their properties at a grassroots level and very protective of their lands for their own well being, you know, do they have water? Do they have healthy soil? Do they have good food? Is there a, a coexistence and a good balance with the wildlife in those areas? they will not be people counting millions of arrivals and billions of dollars. So again, different stakeholders have different visions. 
Um, I think the unified vision really needs to be quality of life for the locals and how that is measured. Economically is one, um, socioecologically is another, health and well-being is, I mean, we have a very unhealthy population, right, that people don't speak about. And that is unfortunate because we have people coming from outside Sri Lanka here to detox and cleanse and eat kotukola and vegan and kola kanda. But we have a population that's, you know, drinking more and consuming more sugar than a lot of places in the world, very high diabetes. And we have people coming to do the opposite. So, and we offer that in an indigenous way, right? So the vision varies currently among between stakeholders. So what's needed is a massive education and awareness campaign that touches each stakeholder where they're at. Big business community is as challenging as the government. Small, uh, small and medium enter entrepreneurs and enterprises have very much understood game plans, right? So you have to look at the property development sector as well, right? What Sri Lanka's tourism has become is a property development game and a rush to develop property. It's quite similar across the world. Uh, and that, the, the vision for property development of the island is really questionable right now. You know, let's build skyscrapers along the coast. Let's build housing estates in the hills. You're really diminishing the quality of life for locals, the product, the ecosystems, natural resources, and it's a huge financial strain on the economy. Who is that all being built for? Just a handful of property developers and maybe some lenders that benefit. Yours is a big ask, but I'm hoping that if we start somewhere, we'll get somewhere. Kaleidoscope is on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to subscribe, follow, and like us for more. We will take care of the risks. Silly good life.